Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. Um, so, to start off with, the zone has exploded over the last few years, especially after going global in 2020. I saw a stat about how you streamed 27,000 live matches or live events last year. How has that been for the company, both operationally and from a content perspective? Sure, it's been um, an incredible journey. And I think um, the answer to that is we've really sort of doubled down on every aspect of the business, um, building on the sort of foundations that we had to build initially to be able to scale like that, to be able to launch globally, and then to be able to launch in markets rapidly and quickly. Um, actually with some of the biggest sports rights um, on, on the planet in certain markets. Um, we got there pretty quickly, um, and now we've looked at every sort of part of the value chain, um, whether it be a technology stack, whether it be staffing, whether it be um, our, the way that we interact with rights holders, and everything um, is changing, developing, growing, um, and really just built an organization uh, that is built to scale, to be able to uh, jump on opportunities in new markets as and when uh, they arise. Um, we've got a new exec management team who have come in. Um, and the difference between our proposition and many propositions is our right portfolio in every market mm -hmm. is different. Therefore, we have to have a very sort of local um, feel to the product. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, we've put... Um, uh, new management teams in many of our biggest markets to really, really take us to the next level uh, in terms of delivering to local consumers. So I think a, va you know, a mix of all of the things that we've got to market pretty quickly with yeah. really doubling down and making sure that we're, uh, we're, we're delivering across all of them, both from a technology, commercial, staff and rights portfolio perspective. Just actually picking up on that rights portfolio, I know that obviously every market is very localised, but I would argue one of the most innovative deals over the last few years has been the one that you have with UEFA and YouTube for the Women's Champions League. Now, we've literally just had the final. It's one of the first deals of its kind. I'd love to um, just learn from you, like how that deal came about. Was it something that you went to YouTube with and then you approached UEFA, vice versa? And also, like, how successful has it been from a fan engagement perspective in terms of differentiating from all the other rights you have? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. Um, this, for, for anyone who doesn't know, is the first time that UEFA have centrally sold mm -hmm. the competition right through the group stages, right up to, uh, to the final. Uh, there was a tender process out there. It's a four-year deal. Um, and we desperately wanted to be involved. Um, we operate in nine, ten core markets. Um, and didn't feel we had the scale on our own to deliver to the mission, which is ultimately to grow the game, mm. to grow the women's game. Um, therefore, we took a, what we think was a sort of very innovative um, proposition to UEFA by partnering with YouTube, the world's biggest video platform that can literally get video to every device in every corner of the world, um, to deliver on that mission. Um, YouTube and Google massively bought into this. Um, and I think we just had collaboratively uh, an incredibly good proposition to take to UEFA that eventually won, won through. Mm. Um, as you say, we just, you know, Turin on, 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 on Saturday was, uh, was incredible. Um, and I just think, you know, the packed stadiums, the quality of the football, the quality of the content that, that we've seen coming out here, the conversation around this um, has just been fantastic. Um, and I don't think we would have done that on our own. Um, I don't think we would have won it on our own. So I think, you know, in hindsight, it was a really, really good thing to do. Um, through season one, lots of learnings to take into season two and make it even bigger. Um, we haven't released uh, the stats uh, from, from Saturday. Uh, I don't know exactly what the sort of aggregate audience is. Um, but I know we've done over 50 million interactions with our content on YouTube. Um, and, you know, again, just to talking to the mission of growing the competition mm. uh, and the demand for the competition, we took a, a relatively last minute view uh, between us and YouTube, which is a free to air broadcast channel, if you like, also um, to work with some free to air broadcasters in some of the major European markets to make it free to air. So it was free to air 
on ITV in the UK, on uh, TFN in France, uh, TV in, 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 in Spain, and, and, a, and a number of other countries as well. So, uh, you know, it, it, you, you couldn't miss it. It, it, it was there for all to see, and um, hopefully, um, I'm sure there'll be a release at some stage in the, in the very near future to show how successful that was. But uh, we're delighted. I think YouTube are delighted and, and UEFA are delighted. But uh, more importantly, the fans who haven't seen this competition before, yeah. um, I hope are delighted too. Oh, my God. I had never seen Barcelona women's team play. Yeah. And I'm now a little bit obsessed with them. Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> Actually, One more convert. <laughs> kind of staying on that topic a little bit, you mentioned the linear partnerships which you had across Europe for the final. And then obviously the competition itself is on YouTube. And we saw earlier about how younger demographics want to watch via OTT. Are you seeing any demographic differences with the types of viewers you're capturing for women's Champions League versus maybe, say, where you have Premier League in a local market? Um, I, I don't know, right. is, is, is my honest answer. Um, I, I, would, I would think not. Mm. Um, and we take a very sort of practical view about where people want to watch. Um, we make the service available to as many people as we possibly can. So it's not just about device penetration and making sure that we have an app that works on a screen this size all the way up to your 85 inch you know, um, OLED screens in your, in your living room and everything in between, which we do. Um, but if there's an audience out there that would prefer to watch via a linear channel, why not? There are you know, hundreds and thousands of um, fans out there who have been used to watching, whether it's the Bundesliga or Serie A or the Champions League or whatever it might be, um, on Channel 253 every Friday, Saturday or Sunday, um, why change that? Yeah? Um, what we can do over, the t over time is convert that audience into an app-based audience, but the app's got to be better. It's got to deliver value more than the linear channel, and that's obviously something that anybody who is involved in the OTT space, just like us, mm. um, is trying to do. Um, that said, You've got to get the basics right first and then grow and build that sort of fan engagement, personalized experience on top of, you know, great delivery so it doesn't buffer. So we'll come back to creating um, an amazing app in a second. But you spoke there about getting the basics right. Now, the Women's Champions League and the Women's Boxing recently, it saw high numbers of concurrent streams. So from an outside point of view, it looks like you've got really strong streaming tech. But obviously, when you guys launched in Italy with Serie A, it wasn't, um, it wasn't smooth sailing, we could say. Can you talk us through some of well, the, that launch process and maybe some of the obstacles and the learnings that you've taken as a result of it? Oh, wow. OK, Sorry. that's a loaded one. Um, we, yeah, we had, a, we had a challenge in our opening weekend of Serie A in Italy. Um, it's the first time uh, that we'd taken Serie A exclusively um, on OTT. Um, there are a number of things that we can control. Uh, there are a number of things that we can't control. Um, we can't control when the season starts mm. and we can't control Italians' holidays, holiday plans. Um, and what you see in the opening weekend of Syria, for instance, is a huge, huge amount of the uh, potential audience traveling, uh, particularly in the south, uh, where some of the networks aren't as strong as they are in, 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 in the major cities. Um, so I think our biggest learning out of this, we've never sort of backed away from this, and you know we've, 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 we've fixed a lot here. Um, our biggest learning here is to be much more network aware, mm. um, which is really understanding the collaboration that we need uh, between all of the people who are involved in delivering that content you know, throughout the value chain. Um, so we've been working very, very collaboratively with the ISPs, with our CDN partners, um, we've delivered um, adaptable bitrate multicast technologies. We've developed our own uh, player, uh, video player, uh, to increase, uh, to reduce buffering time, to increase video start time. Um, so a huge, huge doubling down on technology, both ourselves internally in terms of development, um, but almost as importantly with those other constituent members who are uh, involved in delivering uh, live sport to the, to, to the final mile. Um, we've got our own technology stacks in most of the ISPs and the big telcos in, in, in Italy now. So really being as close to the end user as we possibly can. Mm. So lots of you will be familiar with Net Netflix's Netflix Connect 
uh, product. Uh, we have something we call Design Edge, which is really putting a live optimization technology stack right at the edge of the of the network. So um, I know there was a, there's a lot in there, um, uh, but yeah, it was it, it wasn't a great weekend. Um, <laughs> but every weekend subsequently. Uh, and we are delivering millions of concurrent streams of Serie A in full HD uh, to devices all over Italy now uh, very, very successfully. Uh, we will never rest on our laurels and we will continue to, uh, to innovate and, uh, and make sure that we continue to do that. But it was, uh, it was a learning that you know, isn't exclusive to us. Yeah. Others have been there too, so yeah. Yeah, I bet. Um, going back to what you were talking about, about in order to convert people, I suppose. It's about having a better experience and having a better app. This is putting you on the spot a little bit, but what makes DAZN better than a linear experience? Um, it's, it's all to come. Right. Um, I mean, the, it's everywhere. Mm. Yeah, it's in your pocket, it's on your phone, it's on your, your, your streaming stick, your iPad, wherever, wherever it is. That, that, that's kind of obvious. But what we are now working towards is to give you a reason to open your app on your phone multiple times a day, yeah? So we're not, we're not just serving you the live content. We're giving you a bunch of other content. We're giving you an editorial. We're giving you um, match statistics. We're giving you data. Mm. Um, you've seen we've launched uh, you know, our aspirations to where, where, where betting will go. Mm. Um, all of these services sort of combining to put that in your pocket um, so it's a multiple view per day rather than appointment to view in front of your TV in, in, in the evening uh, and to build a sort of second screen uh, experience that is complementary to that of the, of, of the live game. Mm. So in a, innovation in the broadcast, but also innovation in, in the app and second screen experience you're going to get. So um, expect to see a lot more of that from us over, over the course of the next few months and years. So, so with that, I, I've worked for a sport OTT platform in the past, and whether you're a linear broadcaster or an OTT broadcaster, mitigating against churn, especially when sport is so seasonal, mm -hmm. is one of the biggest challenges. Has this strategy of making sure that DAZN isn't just an appointment to view platform, is that part of trying to mitigate against that? Uh, it it abs absolutely is, and I think you know your statistics on, say, original programming sort of mm. talk to how important content here. The best way to mitigate churn is to create a great product. Mm. It's very and a service that people want to come back to multiple times a day, um, multiple times throughout the week. Um, sport is seasonal, um, but we're lucky that we're not a one sport service. Um, and sports fans tend to have more than one sport they're interested in. So with the data that we're getting back to see what the viewership is, we can see what viewing habits are. We can see that a, a, an F1 fan in Spain is also a MotoGP fan and make sure that we're you know, cross-marketing those opportunities to those fans where we think we've got content that will, um, will satisfy and delight them. Um, I think... Um, ch churn prevention in sport, the one thing that we do have is the season starts every year, yeah? yeah? Um, that's the sort of difference between a sort of a, a traditional movie uh, mm. VOD service, I guess. Um, yes, you might rejoin because, uh, you know, a new uh, Stranger Things series starts, but, you know, in July or August, slightly earlier this year because of the World Cup, you know, these leagues start again. Um, and if you have churned, you do resubscribe yeah. because it's the way and the appointment to view of the way you watch your Serie A or your Bundesliga or your Champions League, whatever it is. So um, we do a lot in terms of making sure people win back and making sure that the, the app is very easy to rejoin yeah. um, uh, as well. So a, a, a mixed approach, I guess, from a content to a sort of usability perspective as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I feel like we can't really have um, a conversation with this topic and not talk about NFTs. It's everywhere in sport at the moment. So one, I would like your opinion on NFTs generally. Do you think they're a flash in the pan? And B, what is, what, what is DAZN active in uh, that space? We, we are, we are. Um, and I am absolutely no subject matter expert in <laughs> NFTs, although we have hired some. So um, the, 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 the challenge for um, a technology broadcast sports business like us is, um, 
they're not necessarily our rights. Mm. Yeah. Um, so where where we do have rights, um, and I think you know one that's well documented is you know our multi-year deal with the Japanese Premier League, the, the J League, uh, where we have a number of NFT rights, and we are partnering with Dapper Labs in Japan to deliver a J League uh, NFT service out there. Um, it's very very early days. Um, I genuinely don't know how it's going. Um, I'm just honest about that. Um, but of course, we're watching this space. We're watching NFTs. We're watching uh, commerce uh, in general um, to see how we can add value to a, you know a sports fans you know day, week, month, and year. So um, uh, I don't think it's a flash in the pan. I think it will evolve. Mm. Um, we're part of that sort of. Um, evolution, I guess. Uh, we're trialing stuff. That's exactly the sort of business that we should be uh, innovating, trying. If it fails, it fails. Uh, if it works, fantastic. Innovate, iterate, and then take it to our other markets um, with, with other rights. So uh, absolutely, we are we are engaged. <laughs> nice. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left. So I want to kind of talk about um, some of the competitive landscape. Um, and the outlook for DAZN. So Viaplay is obviously launching in the UK in the second half of this year, and they've already acquired sports rights, most notably the exclusive rights to the home nations football. Now, compared to other European markets, the UK has a very low proportion of sports spend via OTT. It tends to be tied up with BT and Sky. We saw earlier with some of Ampere's data that there is a shift in preference for wanting to watch via OTT. Do you think Viaplay's entry to the UK or potentially even yours in the future is kind of what sports fans in this market are going to be asking for? And is it a tipping point from the monopoly that we've kind of seen with Sky and BT up until now? It's a big question. It, it <laughs> is. And I think it's sort of fairly well documented about how we were trying to enter the, yeah. the, the, the UK market. Um, and clearly, we're going to have to go to, to plan B on that one. Um, Look, I think it will evolve. It'll just evolve a little bit slower mm. uh, because of the way that the, the rights tenders for uh, the, the big ones um, are sort of lined up um, and it's going to take, take a while. But I think you see, you know, even those the, the big companies hold those rights, the way that they're distributing those rights. Mm. Um, you know, I saw some of the innovation that's coming out of BT Sport in 5G and all of this stuff. They are committed to delivering those experiences um, that, as you say, sort of customers are beginning to crave and are beginning to see in other markets. So uh, I don't think, you know, where they sit is necessarily um, a, a problem for that sort of end delivery. Mm. Um, uh, you know, we don't want to be a player without a big business in the UK. Um, how we get there is, is, is you know, is, is still up for debate and up for some sort of strategic direction. And, uh, you know, there's lots of conversations around that. Um, but I, I, I think it will evolve. Um, I think we will um, have a business here. Mm. Um, it just won't be the plan A that, uh, that's well documented. It'll be slightly longer, you know, slower burn. Mm. Um, but we, we won't give up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess like one final question overall before we talk about the future of DAZN is we keep talking about preferences for linear and OTT, but in a lot of the markets in which you're active, you do have partnerships with linear distributors. So I'm thinking Sky in Italy, and you're available via smart TVs. And with a lot of people now being used to accessing Netflix or Amazon or whatever it is like that, do you actually think there is a huge distinction between OTT platforms and linear now? No, and that was that was kind of my point is let let, let, let the customers decide mm. how they want it. Um, you know, if you watch the Champions League final through YouTube um, and it's got a big BT Sport logo in the top right hand corner, you forget that you're watching it on YouTube and you think you're watching it from BT. Mm. Um, um, I, I don't know whether you're watching via channel 237 or you're watching through the app as long as the consistent quality of delivery and the picture quality is great. I don't think it matters. It's just, you know, we talk about it. We all understand it. But actually, whether you're watching it through an app or a channel, um, I, don't think it, it don't, uh, I don't think it really matters. Where the OTT world needs to innovate is on top of what we can do mm. on top of that, um, that sort of app experience in terms of data overlays, in terms of personalization, in terms of all of those things. And I think we haven't really seen that um, come to fruition yet because I think quite rightly, companies such as us 
have been 100% focused on delivering the infrastructure and getting the basics right. The most important thing is when you hit play, it plays and doesn't buffer. That is massively complicated, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, and there are multiple factors out of your control. We've spent a huge amount of time and will continue to do that, to make that experience great yeah. um, and, and, and better and better. Um, we need to innovate on top now to um, convince you to use your app more often. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, I think that's, that, that's where it comes. Um, that's, that's, that's what we need to do and we will do. And I guess my final question is the last two years have been such a roller coaster and so much has happened. What's next in the next 12 months? I, I don't think it will be any less frenetic. I think <laughs> um, we'll continue to do what we're doing. I think um, with the doubling down on our sort of infrastructure play, our technology stack, um, uh, we will grow. Um, you'll see more announcements around launching of betting services, more NFTs and commerce initiatives. Um, and um, it, yes, and I think, you, you know, number one for us is creating that user experience, um, irrespective of the device you happen to be in front of. It could be your huge TV in your living room, or it could be your mobile, and making sure that we're differentiating experience for then, for, 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 for wherever you are, um, to make sure that we have a, a proper engaged fan throughout the week not just at 7.30 or 8 o'clock on a Friday, Saturday, or 3 o'clock on a Sunday. So I think that's uh, really, really where we're going to see a lot of sort of innovation in terms of user experience uh, of the app moving mm. forward. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Um, if you could all join me in saying thank you to Pete for his time, and thank you so much. Thank you.